In this video, we'll review some of the key elements and concepts in the Human Pathways of Metabolism map. The map is divided into color-coded neighborhoods that show different regions of different metabolite pathways. We'll start with this central region. So the center of metabolism is the TCA cycle in the electron transport chain shown in light tan. The carbohydrates and sugars are shown in pink. Amino acid metabolism is shown in blue. The nucleotides in purple. Lipids together with ethanol shown in green. And in this video, we're only going to be focusing on fatty acid metabolism ketone metabolism, and we'll quickly review ethanol metabolism. We've previously discussed cholesterol metabolism and the steroids. And finally, heme synthesis and degradation. In the lower left-hand corner of the map is the legend, and this includes the vitamins. Here's the list of B vitamins that function as cofactors for the enzymes shown in the metabolic map. These vitamins that have surrounded by the gray box, such as thymine, pyridoxal phosphate, biotin, folate, and cobalamin, each of these, if, they are, if the body is deficient in these particular vitamins, the pathology is directly linked to decreases in the relevant enzyme activities, and in many cases, providing extra pharmacologic doses of these vitamins can help prevent pathologies in the enzyme deficiencies for those enzymes that require these cofactors. We'll start our map tour with the sugar and carbohydrate section. So shown here is part of glycolysis, coming down this way, and gluconeogenesis, going up this way. We have galactose metabolism, which feeds into glycolysis. We have fructose metabolism, which also feeds into glycolysis. Uh, another key feature I want you to notice is that the sugars are always activated and trapped inside cells by phosphorylation. So the first step of glycolysis is a kinase that phosphorylates the glucose, activating it and trapping it. Again, with galactose, we have a kinase forming galactose 1-phosphate, and fructose, first enzyme, is a kinase. Again, activating and trapping the fructose. This becomes very important when we think about gluconeogenesis and glycogen breakdown in the liver, which has expresses the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase, which hydrolyzes the phosphate off, allowing that glucose to be released into the bloodstream. Two of the genetic metabolic diseases or inborn errors in metabolism that you should know are galactosemia and hereditary fructose intolerance. Galactosemia is caused by deficiencies in the galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase. So galactose has to be put onto UDP in order for the galactose to be metabolized further and essentially be converted into glucose. For hereditary fructose intolerance, the problem is deficiency of a liver isozyme of the aldolase that is required to cleave fructose 1-phosphate. We've now moved further down on the map to show the end of glycolysis and the start of gluconeogenesis. So here we have pyruvate, and pyruvate can go many places, including into the mitochondria, where it can be converted to acetyl-CoA by pyruvate dehydrogenase, and of course acetyl-CoA can enter the TCA cycle to produce lots of ATP. If there's a problem with the mitochondria, not enough oxygen, for example, pyruvate can be reduced to lactate and reoxidizing the NADH to allow glycolysis to continue. Pyruvate and alanine can also be interconverted. During conditions in the liver, say when gluconeogenesis is activated, the liver will take up lots of alanine and lots of lactate from the blood, converting both of these to pyruvate. Pyruvate then enters mitochondria, and now pyruvate carboxylase is activated to make oxaloacetate. Note the biotin B7 dependent enzyme here. The oxaloacetate can be converted to malate, which leaves the mitochondrial matrix and gets converted by phospholinopyruvate carboxykinase, a key gluconeogenic enzyme, to phospholinopyruvate, and gluconeogenesis continues up this way. Note that a genetic deficiency of the red blood cell isoform of pyruvate kinase can cause a hemolytic anemia. 
Now we've moved up and to the right on the map, and we're looking at the penose phosphate pathway, which is also called the hexose monophosphate shunt. So the glucose 6-phosphate can enter this pathway through the enzyme glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. There's a whole bunch of inner conversions, and the key things to note here is one of the products is phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. This is the ribose that's used to build nucleotides, so to make DNA and RNA. It also allows us to catabolize five carbon sugars, some of the rare seven carbon sugars, three carbon sugars, four carbon sugars, the etc. And all of these metabolites end up re-entering glycolysis. A very common genetic deficiency in the red blood cell version of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, or G6PD, cause an oxidative stress-induced type of hemolytic anemia. So recall that this enzyme is required to make NADPH in red blood cells. And NADPH is required to keep glutathione in its reduced form. And glutathione is one of the key antioxidants that we have in cells to prevent reactive oxygen species damage. On to the amino acid section of the map. We're not going to go into details of any of these pathways now. The few things I want you to know about them are number one, that all of the amino acids, when they're catabolized, after the amino group is transferred away, an organic acid is left. A deficiency of the catabolism of those uh, organic acids results in an organic acidemia. And number two, each of these organic acids that's produced feeds somewhere into the TCA cycle. Here we're focused on the urea cycle, which is how we get rid of the amino groups from amino acids when we catabolize them. The product of the urea cycle is urea, and I want you to note that it's completely different from uric acid, and we'll look at uric acid in just a moment. Note that the very first step of the urea cycle produces a metabolite called carbamyl phosphate from an enzyme called carbamyl phosphate synthetase number 1. Now, if there is deficiency in the urea cycle somewhere downstream of this very first step, such as ornithine transcarbamylase, the most commonly deficient enzyme in the urea cycle, or arginosuccinate synthase, for example, then there can be a buildup of carbamyl phosphate, and we'll see in just a moment what happens to that carbamyl phosphate. On to nucleotide metabolism. We'll start with the genovosynthesis of purines, a and G, and the pyrimidines C, U, and T. So note first that the purines are built directly on the sugar using nitrogens from glutamine and glycine and carbons from tetrahydrofolate. By contrast, pyrimidines are built free, again using glutamine and aspartate, uh, and then they are attached to the sugar. Note the carbamyl phosphate. During a urea cycle deficiency that causes carbamyl phosphate levels to build up, some of this carbamyl phosphate ends up getting shuttled into excessive pyrimidine synthesis. And what results is that erotate builds up, this free base erotate. And when erotate is protonated, it's called erotic acid. And erotic acid levels in the blood can increase, causing erotic acidemia, and can be used as a blood test for certain urea cycle deficiencies. Nucleotide bases can fall off their sugars, so there are base salvage pathways involved in sticking the nucleotides back on the sugars. So here we have the free base adenine or guanine being put onto the phosphorylated ribose here to make GMP and AMP. This hypoxanthine is just a, an intermediate in the creation of either adenine or guanine. A deficiency in the base salvage enzyme, hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase, causes Leshnihan syndrome, a very severe neurologic deficiency uh, that also results in high levels of uric acid. Here are the nucleotide breakdown pathways. Note that the pyrimidines are catabolized to the amino acid alanine, as well as organic acids that can be converted to TCA cycle intermediates. By contrast, the purines are catabolized to uric acid. 
So uric acid is produced by purine breakdown. It's a totally different molecule from urea produced in the urea cycle. And you'll want to remember that excessive uric acid causes a kind of arthritis called gout. On to heme synthesis and degradation. Heme is synthesized from the amino acid glycine in the TCA cycle intermediate succinyl-CoA to make delta-aminolivulinic acid. This leaves the mitochondrial matrix. Two delta ALAs are put together to make a porphobilinogen. Four porphobilinogens are combined together to give us what's called then a porphyrin ring. There are several more reactions that occur to give us a protoporphyrin 9, which re-enters the mitochondrial matrix, and a few steps later, iron can be inserted in the middle, and we get heme B. There are known enzyme deficiencies in every step of this pathway. The first one, the very first enzyme, is encoded on the uh, X chromosome, and a deficiency is called X-linked sideroblastic anemia. This enzyme requires vitamin B6, or pyridoxal phosphate, and some of these uh, deficiencies respond well to pharmacologic doses of vitamin B6. All the other steps, if there's deficiencies that cause what's called a porphyria, and I've outlined two of the more common of these rare disorders, acute intermittent porphyria and porphyria cutana tarda here. Below is shown the pathway for heme degradation, which produces bilirubin, and bilirubin gets conjugated by the enzyme UD UDP glucuronosyl transferase. Gilbert's syndrome is caused by a deficiency of this liver enzyme. We'll finish with the green section of the map, starting with beta-oxidation of fatty acids. First note that very long-chain fatty acids are oxidized in peroxisomes. Fatty acids that are 12 carbons or shorter can directly diffuse into the mitochondrial matrix. However, those between 14 and 22 carbons, the most common fatty acids, must first be put onto a molecule called carnitine using carnitine palmitoyl transferase number one, a translocase, which gets that fatty acyl carnitine into the mitochondrial matrix, and then carnitine palmitoyl transferase number two puts the fatty acid back on coenzyme A. The fatty acyl CoA then can be oxidized through a series of dehydrogen and we split off an acetyl-CoA at each round of reaction, which can be further oxidized to carbon dioxide in the TCA cycle, and the fatty acyl-CoA is two carbons shorter than before. You'll want to remember that this first acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, there's a whole family of them for long-chain fatty acids, medium-chain fatty acids, short-chain fatty acids, etc., the one final thing I want to point out here is ethanol metabolism is shown. Again, ethanol to carbon molecule is oxidized first to acetaldehyde and then to the tiny little fatty acid acetate where it is stuck on coenzyme A to make acetyl-CoA, which can then enter the TCA cycle. Here's ketone body metabolism. Ketone bodies are only synthesized in the liver, and they're created from acetyl-CoA that's produced mostly from fatty acid oxidation. So under conditions of fasting and starvation or very low-carbohydrate diet, the liver is activated to convert some of the excess acetyl-CoA derived from fatty acid oxidation into production of acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate, the two ketone bodies. These are diffused in the blood and many tissues throughout the body, including the brain, heart, kidney, muscle, etc., take up the ketone bodies and can metabolize those ketone bodies back into acetyl-CoA. We'll finish with fatty acid synthesis, most of which occurs in the liver in humans. So the process starts with citrate leaving the mitochondrial matrix, being cleaved by citrate lyase to give acetyl-CoA that's in the cytosol. Acetyl-CoA is then carboxylated to the intermediate malonyl-CoA. Recall that malonyl-CoA is the same molecule that inhibits carnitine palmitoyl transferase, inhibiting fatty acid oxidation. Okay, So the same intermediate that's involved in fatty acid synthesis inhibits fatty acid oxidation.
Okay, so now we have this wonderful enzyme, fatty acid synthase, which combines the malonyl-CoA with an acetyl-CoA, shoves them together, a CO2 comes off, we have a four-carbon intermediate that then gets reduced in several steps using an ADPH, two steps, to give us a four-carbon saturated fatty acid attached to fatty acyl synthase, another malonyl-CoA comes in, we repeat this process all over again until we build the 16 saturated carbon uh, fatty acid called palmitate. This then comes off fatty acid synthase. Other enzymes can elongate it and add double bonds. And this concludes our overview of the Human Pathways of Metabolism map.